everyone to the first episode of season three. Oh, I've missed you. I've missed you, the community and Rabbanet. How have you been? We are doing well. I am doing well. Thank you. Um, the Royal I haven't seen you in person <laughs> for about a month. Yeah, three weeks to be exact. So we, I, um, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen the family and I just couldn't wait any longer. So I said, let's do this. And so the first week we were in quarantine, they have four days you can, you know, test out and the tests are free there, which is amazing. They want people to take tests. Uh, the second week I was focusing on the kids and then I shipped the kids back with the rabbi. And then uh, the third week I was able to focus on my parents and uh, just, you know, help them out with administrative work. They spent time with the family. It was really, really nice. Um, now you're back, but still in quarantine. Yes, yes. Uh, almost out, almost out. Yeah, although I, I, well, we have to do this on Zoom anyway, you know, now with uh, the lockdown and... Yeah, don't, no, Robert, don't get too, once, right? once you're released from quarantine, don't get too excited. There's not much you can do and there's not many places you can go. Well, hopefully I'll get, be able to get back on my run. <laughs> it's been a while, so... Yeah, yeah. I miss the heat, I miss the heat. So it's only, yeah. You know, I mean, but it's, it's sure. amazing the, the difference, um, you, know, it, you know, it's the same COVID all around the, the world. But the way people are dealing with it is so, it's so interesting. It's, it's in, the, in, in the States, in New York specifically, you, don't, you have to wear your mask outdoors, right? Where here, you don't, uh, which is which right. really weird. And also the kids from the age of two, over two have to wear masks. They have like these little kitty masks for kids over two and up. And here it's only, you know, they, they, wow. they're exempted from under 11, right? So it's 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 um really quite fascinating to see the differences in in the rules there but anyway who knows i guess we'll we'll know at the end of the yeah we don't, we're looking for the rules and hope it works <laughs> very excitement yeah it's different it's different but uh it is what it is but uh it, we're very excited to be back um and we have a great show ahead and we have so many events coming up at the show that yes did you see the email that went out from the show last night it's, um and th this is going to go out this is for all of you to hear um, every week on Sunday evening, you'll be getting in an email from the shul with the events coming up that week. And there's a lot on, well, this for a start. Uh, there's Shurim, there's daily Mishnah, there's daily prayer, there's Friday night services, Shurim, there's Gemara, there's Sedra, there's Parsha, other Chumash, there's, you know, hopefully something for everyone. And we'd love to hear from you if you'd like something different as well. There's a lot of private learning groups going on, a lot of one-to-one -one learning. If you'd like to get involved with that, call me, because we'd love to hear you. From you. I think, you know, um, yeah, I think that's the, the probably the hardest of all this is, the, is not the, the interacting, you know, with people. It's really, that's yeah, yeah. and obviously in, in, in any spare moment we're calling people because we're trying to be in touch with as many people as we can. Yeah. Um, it's impossible to get through to everyone, uh, but, you know, we want everyone to know that we, we haven't forgotten you. Shul is open, uh, but most people are keeping away um, and we respect that and we wouldn't even tell anyone to come to Shul. Don't come to Shul, you see. Uh, but we, we get, we're getting minyanim. We've never not had a minion. And it works. Those who want to come, come. Those who don't, don't. I think that's... Yeah, and we have that's that's we have taken, yeah. We have births, we have engagements, we have bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs coming up. So it's yeah. really, you know, thank God for, for Simchas uh, that we're able to celebrate together. Yeah, sadly, no weddings, though. And that is very hard for couples who are very desperate to start their new life together. Absolutely. Appreciate yeah. that's we really hard. Own, you. We have uh, our own Friday family waiting for Dovey, right? So yeah, exactly. Okay, very soon, um, we'll be able yeah. to see them together. So uh, we have a very interesting Shabbat coming up, right? There's the Mental Health Awareness. Yes, Mental Health Awareness Week. Right. Well, I think it started with Shabbat and then went to weekend and then they extended, you know. Um, a few programs throughout. Uh, I think that's a good thing because, uh, first of all, it raises awareness for mental health. And I think the more it's talked, this is my personal thing, uh, the more it's talked about, the less of a stigma there is. I think that's a big, a lot of the big problem with mental health is people are embarrassed. Uh, and, you know, if someone, God forbid, had cancer, they won't be embarrassed about it. Although many years ago that was the case, but now it's spoken about a lot. Like someone has depression or other mental health issues, I think the more it's talked about, the less there'd be a stigma, and then hopefully the better they can be treated. I think it's a good thing that they've extended their awareness week, and the, I think the more we talk about it, the better. If you don't agree, please but, mention it in the comments below. Just, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, when, when I was in New York, we had, um, there was an unfortunate death um, due to mental health. It, it was extremely, 
you know, I can't imagine that the pain that the family was dealing with. But what, what was what was what I noted was that a few years ago, even many years ago, this would never have even made you know news or people you know it would have been hush hush. Nobody would have ever mentioned that it was due to mental health. And yet the fact that um, they were outspoken about it, and and you could see the parents were involved in in, in their daughter's life. You know they they supported her through through you know community runs. You know and um, the father used to sing with her. And, and they were there with her, um, yet unfortunately, you know, uh, she, you know she, she lost the battle. Uh, but, you know, the fact that, you know, you talk about the stigma that was there so many years ago, I think people are becoming more aware of it and people are talking about it. And, you know, it, it was just it was interesting because I just read in uh, Psychology Today, there's, um, uh, there's an anthropologist, Roy Richard Grinker, who um, explores stigma roots. And he was saying how, it's the culture that really created the stigma. Like we created the stigma of, of you know, of, of what- well, That means we can remove it. Exactly, remove and that's exactly what he said. And, 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 and he says, he's, what, what makes him so proud is that his students, when his students come to him and say, you know, professor, please don't be upset if I say something inappropriate. Yeah, I have Tourette's syndrome. And that makes him like, you know, look at this individual yeah. who's, you know, who's open about it and that's okay. And so I think that's, that's uh, it, it, we've come a, a long way and we have a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, we're not there yet, that's for sure. But I think we're going in the right direction. Yeah, so we're going to be meeting Rabbi Daniel Epstein, uh, who, um, who brought this idea of mental health, mental health awareness week. And Rebitson Hughes from Radlett, a psychotherapist, who will talk about mental health awareness. So let's go meet our interviewees for this week. Mm. Welcome, Rabbi Daniel Epstein, to Norsley TV. How are you? Um, wonderful. So thank you for joining us. So this weekend, we have the Mental Health Awareness Shabbat. And uh, my understanding is that this was your brainchild. How did this begin? And, you know, such an important uh, and vital cause and, and uh, uh, matter that we need to be aware of. So thank you very much for bringing it to, to um, the UK. And uh, tell us a little bit about how that all began. Sure. I think it was all a bit, um, it was a bit of a, uh, an evolution, I guess. I was, uh, when we were interviewing for our position here in Southgate, uh, it was around 2013, 14. Um, and we came in for our, uh, uh, for a weekend just to be with the community so they could see what we were like, uh, that sort of thing, really interesting. And we had an evening at uh, a sort of group of young marrieds, uh, I guess, of the uh, younger members of the community and uh, the families, it was really nice young families. And we had a sort of a really nice sort of Thursday evening. We were chatting away at somebody's house and it happened to be the house of Laurie Rackind, who's the CEO of Jamie, who's one of our shul members. So we were talking, discussing mental health in general. And I then still thought it was a, an important subject. And we were talking about how we could make it uh, an important date in the calendar. What would we do? And uh, so that was 2014 and for a couple of years, sort of thinking about what, where, maybe we'll pick a Sunday, maybe we'll do some sort of Shabbat. There was no real sense of when it would be. Um, and then I was listening to the uh, Torah reading, uh, Kriyat Torah on Parshat Bo, which is the coming, uh, this coming week. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was going through it as I do, and listening to the person reading the Torah, the Bab Koreh, and all of a sudden we get to the plague of darkness. And it like hit me like this light bulb moment. I'm like, wow, wow, wow. The words of the Yamesh Choshech and it, the, the darkness feels tangible. And all of a sudden, I had this parallel in my head of tangible darkness and a sense of paralysis and a sense of not knowing what to do and a, an overwhelming sense of, you know, of, of concern, worry, anxiety, everything would be captured in these words. And Laurie was in shul. I ran over to him and I said, I found it. He goes, what? I goes, I found the Shabbat that it needs to be. He goes, when? He goes, I go, now, right now. So I switched my drasha uh, for that day I just wow. said, I was planning something, but I want to say something else. This is what it is. And please, God, next year, we'll do something with it. And then in classic terms, if, you know, I fell asleep and thought, didn't think about it. And then like November of the next year, woke up and thought, oh my goodness, it's two months away. And we put something together and we thought it'd be just for our community and a few other communities. We picked the ones around us, you know, Barnet and Muswell Hill and like North London, North, North, uh, North, sort of Northwest London. And uh, the word started to get out and it really caught on. Jamie did an amazing job in picking this up and creating this idea. I wrote something for the newspapers and we wrote something for each other, wrote a sermon ahead of time and sent it out. Uh, and about 80 communities joined in the first year. 
And that wow, was amazing. 2017 was the first year we did it. And that's, that's how it started. It was literally a spur of the moment, which uh, I thought would be a good idea. And it's, uh, it's become something really important. That's great. Well, you know, I'm, uh, you know uh, it reminded me when we were first also interviewed, um, and one of the things that they, they test you on is, you know, suddenly you're, 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 you're asked to give a sermon, right? And then, and then the chair comes over to you and says, you know, the prime minister resigned just now. What are you going to do? And then the, the whole sermon has to be switched. So I'm sure you were ready for that. And suddenly to be able to switch, your, you know, the sermon just on the, the brain, you know, the light bulb that just hit while you were reading the Torah was, was brilliant. So yes, on that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting that it's, it's a darkness that, that caught your attention, you know, that because um, many, many are in, in pain and, and, in, and in dark, right? They don't know how to deal with it. They don't know what to do. And uh, it's it's really what they feel inside, right? It's it's the it's the outside that people see, and sometimes and most of the times is, is when they just have to put that smile on their face, yeah. um, and, and it's really hard to get to. So, absolutely. I mean, over the years, uh, have you seen uh, an increase in awareness? I mean, has it has it worked? You know, you've been here more than I have over you know 2016. I guess you know a few years. I mean, just in the past year alone, we've been hearing more. So I know it's been a success, I can say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was, it was a real, um, I think it, it sort of captured a, uh, uh, an unspoken conversation. In other words, there were things that were happening in the community. I think in general, there was, uh, it was not spoken about. It was very much the stigma. And we talked about, and Laurie talks about it a lot, this idea of the, of the you talk about the C word, right? People who are suffering, God forbid, from cancer. And for many years, 25 or 30 years, you couldn't actually say the word, um, you know, and you'd say it quietly, like, we've got, like you wouldn't actually say the word. You wouldn't get it out. You wouldn't use anything because right. it's too They, they had the Yiddish word, right? It was like yen and machla. You didn't, you didn't the even. Machla. The machla, yeah, machla, like right? The machla, right? You wouldn't even say that. And it was, it was too difficult to engage with. It was too frightening. And so mental health was the same. It was, uh, we weren't unsure what it meant and we weren't, um, we, weren't, we didn't have the language to talk about it. We didn't have the freedom or the space or the permission even to mm. talk about it. It would affect your family. It was something that was a real taboo. It would affect your, uh, whether you're in all ultra-Orthodox circles or not, it would affect marriage. It would affect family. It could sure. affect lots of things and potentials as well for partners. And you'd be really worried. And so just the chance to talk about it, and especially for our younger people, it was uh, huge. And then sadly, there are a number of uh, uh, young people uh, in high school who sadly uh, their lives ended very suddenly and uh, unexpectedly let's put it that way and it was quite a difficult thing to deal with for the school for us and so we sadly had a few opportunities I would say to try and help people to talk about what it is that might have happened and to try and strip away some of the taboos and some of the concerns and some of the worries or some of the assumptions that you know we must have seen this coming and we must have known and the idea is that these things are it's an illness. It's a genuine illness. I think one of the most profound things about it is that they used to have this, uh, uh, what, it was a halakha or it was a minhag, uh, this custom that people who had uh, taken their own lives would not be buried in the major parts of the cemetery, Jewish cemetery. They'd be buried at the edges. They'd be buried away from everybody else. Like it was some sort of negation of God, right? Because if you took your own life, you didn't believe in the sanctity of life and therefore you didn't deserve uh, to have, you know, an appropriate burial and you'd be buried at the side. We don't want to talk about it, think about it. Quite shocking. And that changed 25, 30 years ago, but that's not, or maybe a little bit more, but that's not a long time. It's not a long time. And now we understand it's an illness like everything else. And it's sometimes not an illness. You can have, uh, you can have difficult mental health and, and a mental health crisis, and you can have great mental health and a mental health crisis. I mean, look at the last year, right? There are many people who are doing just fine, but anybody in the last year would have come to a point where they just you know you, you you can't take this how much more do we have to go through how much more and it it's it's overwhelming and everyone's feeling down people are feeling that things are difficult and then you talk about you know but it will get better and people do believe you that it'll get better they just can't they they're, can't, in, the, they're they, in this they darkness yeah yeah they can't grab it and there was the and the idea the flip side of that worse it says vayamesh choshech and it was Choshech al Eretz Yisrael. It says, "Ulechol bnei Yisrael haya all b'moshvotehem." Right? All b'moshvotam. All the, the children of Israel had light in their dwelling places. And so it's not just that we had it and they didn't. It's that the notion in the Torah of bnei Yisrael is people who've declared themselves they're dedicated to God. They're dedicated to whatever is right and whatever is appropriate and whatever may be difficult. But 
but long-standing, moral, upright, correct in the world. That's the notion of uh, uh, B'nai Israel. At least that's how we're supposed to behave. And once you have that orientation, <clears throat> then even if there's darkness all around you, you can summon, as you just said beautifully, that inner light, that <clears throat> moment that tells you that you'll, you will get through it somehow and you will figure it out and you will move yourself forward. And yeah, no, so you absolutely. Tell people and reassure people that it's good. Yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting, you know, talk about that the Israelites had that light, you know, and, and I think that really maybe connects to the or la goyim, you know, that we have to be that light onto the other nations. And, and seeing how Israel is really being the leader in the vaccines and, you know, hopefully bringing that light to us and, hope, you know, bringing that uh, salvation and, and, and hopefully the cure um, and making this, you know, this pandemic slowly disappear. So that's yeah. definitely an interesting uh, point that you bring up. That's a lot so, of pressure, yeah. though. Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a lot of pressure to feel like you have to be the light for everyone else. And that's right. whether it's right. yourself or your family or whatever's going on around you, that can be itself overwhelming that why I just have to be. And especially for us, I think, as uh, community leaders, it's, it's tough, right? We are supposed to be the ones who are on point. We are, you know, we're online. We switch on. It's a big smile. Everything's fine. <laughs> and uh, it's tough. It's absolutely exhausting. And you need to figure out how you get through that. So even the... The, to be the or la goyim, uh, as it were, that's a lot. That's a lot to ask. You know, or la tzmenu, maybe. <laughs> we like to ourselves, we'll start with that. And then we can figure out everybody else. Well, I mean, I think the, the support um, that we have from each other, from the family, I think that's, that's, a, that's a key. It's a key to, to, what, to how to get through it. I mean, you, you mentioned um, brilliantly in, in your recent JC article about, you know, taking that, you know, having two choices. Some, you know, in life, some we have two choices. We have yes or no. But then in, specifically with mental health, we have to have that pause, right? We have to take time to just think. And, and only, the only people, the, the, the way that can happen is if you have that support system, right? If, if you have that someone to say, hey, wait a second, let's think about this before you make that choice. I mean, how did you, I, 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 there was a brilliant point that you made. How did that, how did you come about? Is that a, a known thing in, in mental health? Is that- so This is, yeah, this is one of the ideas that I was blown away by. It was really quite empowering where, somebody you feel like you're and you think of the worst possible scenarios of somebody who genuinely believes that there's no other options to take in life other than to end it god forbid and you think to yourself wherever they are whatever they are like god forbid people should feel that they have come to the end of all possible options and that then the next action they take will be the one they hope will put an end to this pain and what you're saying to them is that the pain may be may very well be exactly as you describe it, right? And your sense of what options you have may be, you may be correct. In other words, this may not be a crazy or, an, or, a, or a misguided um, decision. You may have genuinely thought you've exhausted all possible avenues, all opportunities, financial, emotional, physical, familial, right? Everything is gone. You have nothing. And the question is, at that point, according to a mental health uh, first aid, that, that you don't need to make a decision at that point. What we need you to do is basically hit the pause button. That doesn't mean that what you have decided to do may not be in your mind at that point absolutely correct. That in itself is shocking to have reached that point. But let's assume, if we're talking in theoreticals, that that could happen. What I'm saying to you is don't make that next choice. Don't do anything. Just pause, hold. Now let's take all of those moments you have arrived at all those conclusions and try and revisit them one one at a time and sometimes you get a few seconds right if somebody god forbid is going to do something that's really fatal and you are with them or you hear about it and you get to them just at the moment where right, right. or you have a little more you give me an hour let's just talk about this right or we've got a real journey to take let's take a few months a few years to get you back from the, the abyss if you can get someone to agree with you that they may still be correct. This may still be the only course of action. What you're saying is don't take the choice now. Let me work through with you all of the situations. And God forbid, we'd never get to the scenario where, you know, you're absolutely right. There is nothing else because we don't believe that. Jews, by definition, people who are people of the covenant, we have this relationship with Hashem, who is infinite and boundless and with abundance there is no point at which there is no further option for us and that hope which we have which rabbi Sachs used to speak about all the time it's hope it's this belief there's no tragedy in judaism there's 
hope at the end of every single, every single scenario. And if you can help someone to connect to that idea, then they will see light. Even if it's just a crack in the, you know, the tiniest smidgen of, you know, of a, of a, some of a first dawn, right? There's nothing except some, you descend something, just take them on that journey and that will help them through and that will help us all through. Excellent. It's a, it's a beautiful point. And, you know, I think it's even more um, on, on, uh, on even an individual level as well. You know, you talk about that we're, people are going through uh, a lot, you know, during this pandemic, dealing with so much, you know, talking about Zoom schooling and working from home and everything else. And sometimes, you know, you just feel overwhelmed and you need to take that pause, right? I think it's a great uh, advice to, to, to anybody really. It's just time you feel like you have, okay, what should I do now? This or that? And you know what? Sometimes you just have to step back and say, you know what? I'm just going to take a break for one second and take it all in, take it, you know, and see what's going on before I make that the next decision, whatever it is. And yeah. so I think it's, it's, a, it's great advice um, for in any mental state that one can be in is to just take that pause. Yeah, we're, we're fortunate our kids are a little older, right? So we've right. got four kids, two, two, two away, you know, two in Israel and two at home. And our home kids are 14 and 17. Uh, yeah, so it can get a little hairy here, you know, here and there. But by and large, you can sit down with a 14 and 17 year old and have a conversation and figure out what's next. But I, I listen to and I hear about families with little, lots of little kids running around at home. And just the sheer pressure, the sheer exhaustion that you can't, mm -hmm even make any decisions anymore. You're just, you're beyond, you're finished and you all need to get out, but you can't go anywhere and there's nowhere to go and nothing to do. And how many times can we go to the park again? And we just, you know, we can't see our friends and it, it is completely overwhelming. And all we can say is, you know, just, we will get there and you need to figure out and something and we all need to step in. So if it's, you know, us spending some time with our nieces and nephews who may need some, uh, who are a little younger just to give our, you know, brother-in-law and sister-in-law a break, then we'll try that. And if we need to go somewhere else and people need to take our kids so they can have some fun with them while we, we all need to help each other. And then it comes back to this idea that it, it takes a village, right? Right. To raise a child. So we all need to somehow figure out if we have a little spare time and spare capacity. Now we're being asked to, I think, uh, just use it maybe a little bit for just a little bit of other people's, what they're going through, even just validating that, you're entitled to feel absolutely frazzled. This has been months and months and months of this. And it's not going away yet, but it's going to go away because look at this, a vaccine in less than a year from three different sources, uh, many of whom were had, uh, we we're so proud, had Jewish people s significantly involved in their development or their, uh, or their uh, you know, validation. It's incredible. We are humbled and we are, uh, we're very blessed that we do this because we believe that hope will drive solutions for the future. And that's what we want to give to people. Sure, absolutely. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for, for bringing uh, the Mental Health Awareness Shabbat uh, you know, to, to the nation and to, uh, we're happy to hear that many con uh, shuls are, have signed up and um, it's definitely something that uh, we need to, to be more aware of and uh, be there. And uh, as you say, you know, I think the support that people need to know that we need that, that the, the key is support to have that, have that family support, friend support, or bidding support is, is really important. So, yeah. um, thank you very yeah, much. For, just, for we will get there. We will get, and we will get there and we will get through will. this just like we did many other times and we will persevere we will and, again in the future. and be, and be greater. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. very much. And Yashikach and all the work that you do. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi Epstein. So it's, uh, it's, you know, it's quite interesting that how he chose Parsha's bow to be the mental health awareness, right? Yeah, plague of darkness, yeah. That's right, that's right, you know, we're all in, in the dark. Um, but what was interesting, you know, like he mentioned uh, about taking, you know, a pause, that people need to take a pause. You know, they don't have to make a decision, yes or no, they just need to take a pause. And what, what, when, I, when he said that, I thought about, you know, you know the uh, Paro's hardening heart, you know, we, we, we hear all the time that, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's Par heart so to not let the people go. Why, you know, and, and it's always like, you know, what, what, there's so many different reasons of what, why that happened. But um, my understanding of it is that, you know, Paro is a little bit, you know, stubborn. You know, he was like, he was, he was like, absolutely. He, he, he like went, you know, he's like, I'm going to like push this, you know, even further. You're going to tell me I can't, I'm going to let the people go. No, absolutely not. And he made it even worse, right? He made it harder for the for the yeah. Jews, right? He put more 
um, work on them. And so sometimes, you know, when we're, I think when we have this idea in our heads, like we, we, we're, sometimes we're determined, and this I think across the board, anything, not only specific to mental health, but anytime when we feel so overwhelmed with things in our lives, we feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to double down. I'm going to, you know, go full force and I'm going to, you know, push forward. Sometimes we just have to take a step back and say, you know what, take that pause, take say, you know, where am I? You know, maybe, maybe this, this way is not working. Let's, let's see how uh, we need to figure out, um, you know, other things here, other, other, other ways to, to possibly work. And I think that's the problem with Paro. Paro didn't listen. He, he just absolutely wanted, you know, he just felt that this was the only way that, we're, that was going to happen. And he doubled down even worse and just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. That's why he was no pause to think. Exactly. And, and I think that piece, that advice is so important to, to anything, right? Especially now, you know, we're, we're, we're Zoom schooling our kids and you know, working and trying to balance it all. And sometimes they're like, okay, how are we going to do this? What should we do now? This, that, or the other. And you're like, you know what? Just take a break. <laughs> Let's just take a break. Let's take a pause and, and, and uh, figure it all out. And I think that a breather, yeah, you know, no, I think that, that. we all need that. I think it's, it's important. Um, um, great yeah, advice. Okay, so th thank you for, for that, Rabbanit. Welcome to Norsley TV, Reb Tenkhana Yuz. Yeah. You. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Um, first of all, Mazel Tov on your recent uh, baby girl. That's wonderful news. We always like to hear such great news during these uh, sad times. So. Yeah, thank um, God. Yeah, thank God. Hashem. Thank you for adding uh, Simcha, Simcha during this time. Wonderful. So, uh, Chana, you are also a psychotherapist for the NHS um, in St. Albans, and uh, you also work privately. You help adults and young people with depression, anxiety, and other mental health related issues. And so welcome. And we're really uh, honored to, for you to be on, to be on RSA TV. Talk about a little mental health awareness. As we know, it's, it's coming up this weekend. So you've been in a practice for quite a few years. Um, you know, during this time, have you seen a rise in mental health cases um, in, in any specific dem demographic in, in your practice? So um, I work specifically with adolescents and teenagers and their families. I actually, uh, before my maternity leave started, I worked in CAM, so it's Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services in the NHS. And um, <clears throat> I would say that there has been good news and bad news in terms of um, the impact of the pandemic. I think, I mean, recently there's been a lot of studies. Just last month, there was a study by the Mental Health Foundation and the results aren't surprising really. They've shown that there has been a steady increase throughout the duration of the pandemic of young people's mental health difficulties, of their sense of <clears throat> loneliness, their sense of anxiety, you know, their anxiety about the situation has worsened. Um, and in general, there has been a decline in young people's uh, mental health over the past few, few months, understandably so. Um, I think that in particular, there's been two types of families who have felt it maybe more severely. Um, there's been the families that were relying pretty heavily on external services. So those who were really relying on those face-to-face -face appointments with possibly social services or youth support, or were really relying pretty heavily on their kids' school attendance. Um, and as you know, you know, because of the pandemic, these services have been really heavily disrupted. So it's, it's been really tough for those families. They don't have that same support anymore. Um, so there's been quite a significant decline for, for their well-being. Um, and I think what this recent study really highlighted, and that's what I found from my experience as well, is that young people or adults as well with underlying mental health conditions, they were already quite vulnerable, already having a bit of a hard time. Um, you know, they've really struggled with the increased pressure from the, the pandemic and you know, our service is very similar to many others and, and waiting lists are unfortunately growing. Um, there's been less, clinicians have been less available because clinicians have been off, off unwell, off sick. So that's the bad news. You know, unfortunately, there's a lot of bad news. Um, I think the good news is I have met several families in which their young people have felt, particularly at the beginning of last lockdown, have felt quite a relief that uh, exams were cancelled, that they didn't yeah. have and school, um, you know, a lot of young people find kind of the stimulation and the social experience of school quite challenging. Um, and so, especially those who are already engaging well with services, 
the switch from face to face to online has been surprisingly smooth in many cases. They have got the hang of managing their own well being. Um, and again, the stresses has been reduced because they don't have to stick to their old routine, commute to school, uh, get the hang of a lot of face to face interaction in the classroom. So uh, in, in many cases, I have found that their mental health has improved actually with their stay at home. So there, well, there is a lot of bad news, but there is some good news as well, I think. Uh, that's, that's actually quite fascinating because, you know, what we've been hearing is a lot, you know, because of the canceled uh, GCSEs and A levels, you know, possibly now, you know, coming around second, second time um, and, and the, the canceled Israel tours and, and, every, and, and their Poland trip, you know, so, so we, you know, it's definitely the, the, the adolescents um, what we said, that feel the most hit, right? I mean, obviously there's the whole, um, you know, elderly who've been isolated and that's another whole um, area that, that we have to attend to as well and that, that we, you know, try to do what we can there. Uh, but, but specifically this demographic have, have been canceled. <laughs> A lot of their, you know, social affair, academic affairs have been canceled and, and, and we felt, you know, it's, it, you know, we always thought that they were the ones you know, who, who, and, and there are those who really are, are suffering through that. And yet, um, I, know, I didn't hear, I didn't consider the, the positive side of that, 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 that some people feel relieved that it's like, okay, wow, one less thing to deal with um, and, and those who are struggling socially. Uh, so that's, that's think, interesting you know, to hear. You're right, this is a really, really vulnerable gr uh, group of people because you gotta remember teenagers, they're developing their social identity in terms of their life cycle events that, you know, each social experience, social interaction, you might remember when you were a teenager, they felt quite intense, you know, everyday experiences that we take for granted now, actually, when you were an adolescent, felt quite intense and quite, felt quite important and valuable. And that's because they really were. This is a really key time for them to develop their social identity. But you've also got to remember that on the other hand, young people nowadays are tech savvy. They're used to a significant period of their lives being online. They're used to developing their social identity through those means. So I think in a way they are the part of the demographic that are most equipped for this pandemic, ironically. Um, wow. Also wow. on the other hand, they're the, the, the group that are having the hardest times. Right, very interesting. I mean, is there anything as parents that we, that we can, um, you know, notice, you know, look out for that we should, you know, be aware of say, okay, you know what, our kid is not doing that well, you, should, you, know, we need, you know, it's possibly a professional to bring them in. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. And I get asked it a lot. And I think it's a difficult one because as you know, you know, every family behaves differently. Every teenager behaves differently and teens change from one minute to the next, you know, one minute you can have a very talkative teenager and the next minute they're lying in bed and you don't know what's happened. So I think there are a few bits of advice to give, but also it's, it's, it's very important to highlight that it isn't in quite an individual answer. Um, I think the main warning signs are for a parent to notice if so, there's been significant changes in their teen. So I think it's really, really important, if possible, to maintain a good relationship, relationship with your teenager, to keep dialogue open, to make sure that you're still talking to them and checking in on them. Not, not micromanaging, you know, teenagers hate uh, mm. helicopter parenting, but just checking in and making sure they're okay yeah. and really, really keeping your finger on the pulse of their emotional well-being uh, and in that way you're going to notice if there are changes and then right. if there are any significant changes for example your teen you know was really sociable um, but now they've become quite withdrawn have there been any changes in their sleep patterns and their eating patterns so any significant changes I think an in tune and astute parent who's who's got their finger on the pulse is more likely to kind of notice those changes and then a really important bit of advice is, um, you know, you, you can't lose by reaching out to a professional um, mm. or by making your teenager know that there is those options out there. There is that support out there. Um, there's no shame in reaching out. And if they need the support, it's better to reach out earlier rather than later. You know, if you think about it, worst case scenario, you've got a wasted appointment. Um, <laughs> God forbid worst case scenario and you leave it too late, you know, mental health difficulties do escalate pretty quickly, um, particularly in this age, age group. So right. uh, that, that's the advice I would offer. Keep your finger on the pulse, keep an open dialogue and um, reach out sooner rather than later. 
Right. That, that uh, definitely makes sense. And, you know, if, if we if any doubt, you know, time we have a, a thought about it, a physical ailment, we go see the doctor. So why not? If there's a doubt, then um, go see a psychotherapist. Absolutely makes it makes sense. Um, and, and especially, you know, um, that, you know, it really segues into the, the stigma issue around mental health. Right. I mean, um, this this mental health awareness Shabbat is, is all about, you know, making is about awareness. And, and, and for years, um, you know, mental, no one ever talked about it, right? Everybody was hush hush. Um, and specifically, even, even in the Jewish community, um, it's still in some areas. I mean, slowly, we're slowly hearing stories publicly coming out and, and brave people coming in and, and saying their stories. Um, we have a, a panel actually on Sunday that, that we're, we're hosting. Uh, but but is, is there, um, it's actually quite interesting, um, you know, why, why is it specifically in the Jewish community more of a stigma, or it, you know, it, it seems to be at least more of a stigma in the Jewish community um, when, when the founding psychotherapists such as uh, Frankel and Freud, you know, were Jewish themselves. I mean, is there any correlation in that? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, psychotherapy in my training, I felt quite proud really because so many of the founding psychotherapists, I mean, I trained in family therapy and Salvador Mnuchin, who, who was so um, creative and so thoughtful and really brilliant in his approaches, and he was Jewish. Um, and you're right, there's this huge dichotomy. On the one hand, we have all these Jewish psychotherapists, and on the other hand, there still is this intense stigma in the community. Um, I do feel that that's changing. I do feel like, for example, the work of Jamie, who's been fantastic mm -hmm. in kind of highlighting the importance of being open about mental health issues, um, has really, I think, change is, is on the horizon and, and we've got a way to go, but I think we've accomplished quite a lot in, in recent years. Um, and there are many different reasons, cultural and historic and sociological reasons why mental health difficulties has been such a stigma, both for our community and, and other minority communities, and in general, I think, um, in, in the world, yeah. worldwide, there has been a stigma for mental health issues. I think one particular reason that I have thought of about the Jewish community um, and why it's such a stigma is because I feel like the Jewish community is very much a chesed oriented community. We love to give, we love to support each other, and it's a really high value. It's a really kind of, um, it's, it's really quite impressive when you can be somebody who performs acts of chesed and supports other people. There's a lot of pride in that. So mm. I think that when an individual becomes vulnerable themselves and they become not the one who gives chesed, but the one who might need to be a recipient of chesed, I think there has been quite a lot of shame connected with that position. Um, so I think as a community who gives so much, I think in particular, we feel quite vulnerable when we have to take. Um, and I think over the years, there has been this stigma that it is some sort of weakness or an individual or a family has failed in some way if they have mental health difficulties. But I think the community is coming around to the idea that it isn't anybody's fault. It's nobody's done anything wrong when they do have emotional difficulties. And I think slowly, slowly, we are becoming more open and as I said, with the great work of many organizations, there is a cultural shift. So hopefully it's, please God, we'll continue going in that direction. And I think people will be able to reach out much more easily and get the support that they need without the shame. It's very interesting. I mean, you, you talk, it's an interesting um, angle with the, with the chesed a bit. Uh, I mean, you, you nailed it in your article in the JC this past weekend about, uh, you know, when it comes to somebody having a physical ailment, you know, we're already out there giving the, you know, chicken soup, you know, treating them. And then suddenly, you know, when they have, when they're struggling, um, you know, emotionally, we, we as, you know, help, friends, oh, how family, we don't know how to approach it. And, we're, and we, we sort of take a step away and, and, and there's this like awkwardness, they don't know how to deal with it. And yet that seems to be, the, you know, the situation where they need you the most, right? And yet we're not there. I and mean, what would you advise how to, to be able to address uh, mental health issues? Yeah, I th that's a really good point. I mean, it is a bit of a worry, you know, and it's confusing for a lot of people who are not familiar with mental health issues and maybe they've never encountered anybody who's struggled in that way before. Um, it's confusing. I think people feel a little bit um, worried about whether they're going to say the wrong thing or put their foot in it. Yeah. Maybe it can be compared to, you know, the first time you had to attend a shiver. You're not really sure whether you're saying the right thing or what to say. I think from my experience, um, it, it never... It, 
it's never a bad thing to reach out to somebody. I think most of the time people really appreciate um, somebody else reaching out to them, somebody else checking in. If you think about mental health illness in particular and the stigma that comes along with it, it's an intensely lonely experience, scary and lonely and isolating. And I think to have somebody who reaches out just to check in is really, really important. Um, mm. Whether or not they open up to you or whether they find somebody else, that's a different issue. And that's very individual. That depends on the family. Right. Just like with a physical illness, some families like to speak about it to everybody they meet. And some families are much more private in their approach and prefer just to speak to a few sure. people. Um, so similarly with emotional illness, you know, you don't know if you're going to be the one who they chat to or not, but I think it's really important to offer um, and to check in and to ask, you know, to give some practical suggestions of uh, what you might be able to do to support them. So do you want to have a chat with me or do you want me just to do your shopping or do you want me to give you, you know, pre-COVID times or please God soon to give you a ride to the hospital? Do you want me to come visit for a coffee or would you rather, you know, me take your kids out for the afternoon? So I think it's really important to, number one, to check in, um, to check in and just make sure that they are getting some support, not necessarily you, but they do have other support that, that, um, so that they, they are managing and they are getting the, the support that they need and also to offer practical suggestions of any support that you could offer. Yeah. I think those are really important. So when in doubt, definitely reach out and check in. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you know, the, the time you, you're, you're, you give us and as well as everything that you do for, for the community and specifically in Radlett and um, for the people that you assist in, in this amazing work uh, important vital work that, um, that we all know that it's, it's, it's really uh, becoming more, like we said, bringing awareness to, to, the, to the public and it's important that people uh, know how to approach it and, and how to deal with it. So thank you very much. You're Have welcome. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Rebitson News. Uh, very interesting. And of course, we are always thinking of how we can support the youth in our community. Uh, we have wonderful the youth directors. I hope you've had a chance to meet them either virtually or in person. Gilla and Sammy Liebert, who have seemed to have settled down really quickly and they've got straight into it. They're programming, they're making contact with many people um, and so far done very well. Um, and any support that you need uh, for the young members of our community, again, please be in touch because we are here for you. And so this uh, Thursday evening, Jamie is uh, launching the Mental Health Awareness um, Shabbat with a utopia. And um, we have a little clip of they're having uh, many different people supporting it. So it's with Rachel Riley, you know, a little clip um, of her telling us more about it. So here it is. I am very proud to be hosting Jamie's Utopia event live on the 21st of January, where we'll be talking all things mental health. I'll be joined by celebrity guests, by mental health campaigners and people benefiting from Jamie's support. They'll be sharing how COVID has affected them and what their post-COVID utopia looks like. It's going to be a fantastic evening, so don't miss out. I'm really looking forward to seeing you then. Okay, and, and Arshul as well is hosting a uh, mental health panel discussion hosted by Rachel Freilich on Sunday at 8 p.m. on Facebook Live. Oh, that's great, that's great. So we're looking forward to uh, zooming into that. But now we'd like to move on to uh, the next item on our agenda for tonight because uh, our member, David Wolfson QC, who is now Lord Wolfson of Tredegar, uh, has been sworn in in the House of Lords, and uh, Rabbi Daniel Friedman speaks to him about it. Good evening, David Wolfson. It's such an honor to have you here. We, you are here as part of our series on RSD TV where we are interviewing the Bali Kriya of uh, Hampstead Gardens Suburb Synagogue. And I have to say, despite there being only 13 men in shul this morning, you did an outstanding job. So yashikach to you. Well, thanks very much. I think we got, uh, we got most of the plagues in the right order, which is good. <laughs> well, that, that, that is important because when you're getting things in terms of order and law, or law and order, that's really why you're here this evening as the new parliamentary, parliamentary undersecretary, uh, for of state for for the ministry of justice 
new minister of justice and in fact lord wilson so mazel tov and thank you very much to, to uh call you a friend not just a member of the community but someone who who i really hold in incredible high esteem and consider a mentor and and someone that um so blessed to be part of my life so tell us a little of the background of how you came to this new position well um i've been working doing some work for the government uh over the past sort of five or six years on various issues so when michael gove was uh secretary of state for justice I did some work on uh, the Human Rights Act and the British Bill of Rights. I've done quite a lot of work on Brexit, jurisdiction, enforcement of judgments after Brexit, and how the legal world can be positioned after Brexit. Uh, and I did a bit of work for the government on the uh, controversial uh, UKIP uh, Act as well. And, um, and I got a phone call uh, out of the blue, really, uh, in October. Um, asking me to, if I'd consider taking a position uh, in the government. And um, of course, being the government, they, they say, they ring you at uh, two o'clock on a Friday afternoon and say that they'd like an answer by Sunday evening, if possible. Uh, so you don't, you don't get much opportunity to think about it. But it's an interesting challenge. It's very different to what I was doing before. And uh, so far, about three weeks in, I'm, I'm still enjoying it. That's really amazing. Well, you know, I, I don't know what took them so long because you are truly one of the uh, incredible uh, leaders and uh, most thoughtful and intelligent people that I know. Uh, so you have, as I understand, uh, decided to take the title of Lord Wolfson of Tredegar. But where is Tredegar? So uh, Tredegar is in South Wales. Um, for those who, for whom South Wales is just a sort of a name, it's uh, not far from Cardiff. And there were a number of Jewish communities in the late 1800s and early 1900s uh, in the valleys. Uh, Let me ask you just for a moment. This is another connection, by the way. I'm from New South Wales. Oh, New South Wales. Okay, right. Well, New South Wales is rather different, uh, probably warmer, but I think they also have cold. And it was partly because of the cold that, um, that the Jews went to South Wales because it was economically booming. Um, a lot of the immigrants, so my great grandparents on my father's side went there, and they were basically traveling salesmen. Uh, they started off peddlers, became small shopkeepers, small traders, and South Wales was booming. King coal, people were paid in cash every week, so people sold on a, a weekly tab. And, um, and there were little Jewish communities in Tredega, in Bargoed, I mean, Hanethli. My great grandfather is buried in Merthyr. Merthyr Tidfil, where the Jewish cemetery is on the top of a hill. I think that was probably the only land that they were either given or could afford to buy. And it's a cemetery on an angle of about 45 degrees. Absolutely remarkable, but it's beautiful in its own way. And after the First World War, those communities really died out. People moved away. Um, so there was, a, there was a period of maybe 30, 40 years when those communities uh, were in existence and I think they there was another feature because the South Wales non-Jewish community were mainly Methodist first of all they were very into their Bible they prayed in small groups in chapels not unlike a shtibol and they were also non-conformist in legal terms they weren't they weren't part of the established church so from a religious point of view they were also outsiders so I think there were a number of factors which came together to enable those communities generally to, to thrive. Well, when you say generally, I know that uh, Tredega, the name Tredega does conjure up um, memories of a stain on our Jewish history uh, in these parts. Um, tell us a little about the 1911 riots and, and the impact that had on the Jewish community. So, I mean, there were riots uh, in Tredegar and in a few other communities uh, in South Wales in 1911. In fact, my great uncle Jack was born in the middle of the riot. And in the family, he was always known as Jack the Riot Baby because he was born in the middle of this riot. Um, various, some people were roughed up, shops were, uh, shop windows were smashed. Um, Churchill, uh, who I think was Home Secretary at the time, uh, was about to send in the army and I think did mobilise the army. Um, but the riots ended really as quickly as they'd begun. The cause is not entirely clear, 
Um, some people put it down to general xenophobia on the part of the people behind the riot. Some people say that there were uh, Jewish uh, landlords who split up cottages uh, and put a lot of families in cottages meant for a single family and that stirred up resentment. It's not entirely clear. There's been quite a lot written about it. Um, but I, I think the important thing is to see it as a blip because it was a blip. And I know my grandfather, um, Oliver Shalom, was always spoke about Tzadikah in very warm terms. Um, I mean, he, he spoke English, Yiddish and Welsh, uh, which is a, a fantastic and quite unusual combination, I think. Right, right, right. And I know you, you mentioned to me how proud your parents are, not only of your new appointment, but of the fact that you've named, you've taken the title uh, of Tradiga. Uh, and it's real Hakar Satarv, and that's important, that we show appreciation to places that took us in. Uh, we were leaving war-torn Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, and we came to this country, and this country, uh, you've uh, called in another article, uh, an Umm al Chesed, a nation of, of kindness, uh, graciousness, the way it took our, our forebears in, my forebears personally went to the, the north of England, uh, to Sunderland, you know, coal mining as well uh, going on there. So, and then to be able to say, you know what, yes, uh, the riots and other things were just blips and to be able to say, you know, this is, this is who I am and these are my roots and you know, Yasha Kawaf to you. So tell us a little about uh, your plans for the ministry and the way you see the House of Lords going forward. What, what, uh, how does David Wolfson fit into the framework of it all? Well, there's really two parts of the job. The job. Uh, there's a the departmental bit and the parliamentary bit. So the departmental bit, um, there were a number of ministers in the Ministry of Justice. The head of the department is the Lord Chancellor and we have different areas of specialization. So my areas are really the areas which I, I've got experience in, uh, civil justice, um, what they call a global Britain, which is a, a term used to really encompass two things. First of all, promoting London as a litigation and arbitration center, which of course is what I was doing in my practice all the time. Uh, and also relations with the profession, so with the Bar Council, the Law Society and the other legal bodies. Uh, and also I am the uh, point minister for the Crown Dependencies. And um, I wonder whether people watching will be actually able to name the Crown Dependencies. Um, I'll, give, I'll give people three seconds to see if they know them and then I'll give the answer. Okay, it's Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. Um, if you thought about Gibraltar, no, you got that wrong because that's a British overseas territory. So I'm the point person for Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man, which have a special status in the UK. So, so the news is until this past year, probably our viewers wouldn't have gotten that. This past year, when people were looking to just go on holiday anywhere that they could get to, everybody was Googling where can they get to within UK travel laws, but still be able to be safe. And I think all of them still have their borders close to, to mainland uh, Brits. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the moment is not so much finding a place where you can go to. The problem at the moment is that legally you can't leave. Uh, and of course, as a government minister, I would advise everybody to read the regulations very carefully. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. So the House of Lords, how much time do you spend there? So. I will be spending quite a lot of time there because um, there's only one justice minister in the Lords. So although those are my departmental areas, when it comes to Parliament, anything to do with justice comes across my desk, so far as the House of Lords is concerned. So whether it's answering questions, tabling uh, statutory instruments, debates, taking bills through Parliament, that's really quite a big part of the job. So the two bills which I'm working on now, there's a domestic abuse bill which is going through the Lords uh, in the week beginning the 25th of January. And in the same week um, as the uh, counter-terrorism bill. So that's quite a lot of work. And of course, these are areas which in my practice, I didn't really work on. So it's been quite a big learning curve uh, getting on top of the material. Right. So I think really where you're really a pioneer 
Uh, we were discussing and to bring this full circle from the beginning of our chat now uh, is I don't know how many Lords have spent their downtime learning their laning in the House of Lords. And when I put that to you, uh, David, you suggested, well, it's not just laning. Uh, tell us really, tell us about the Rashba and, and your, what you're really learning in the House of Lords. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to have a weekly uh, share with a, a chap called Diane Dadoun, who's on the Sephardi Betin in London, but he, he lives in Israel. And we have a weekly share on sort of Jewish legal topics. Um, and this week we were working our way through a, a response of a tshuva of the Rashba on a concept called Dina de Malchuta Dina. It's the cases where Jewish law defers to the law of the land and enforces the law of the land as if it were Jewish law. And um, so I was doing that in my office in the Lords. 14th century, 13th or 14th century Spain. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and, and it's interesting to me as a lawyer, because one way of looking at that concept, it's what, it's what English lawyers would call conflict of laws. It's when one legal system asks itself the question, shall we recognize the laws of another legal system? And I mean, it's interesting to me as a lawyer that the concept of Dina de Malchuta Dina is found in the Talmud Bavli, in the Babylonian Talmud, but not in the Talmud Yerushalmi, not in the Jerusalem Talmud. And I think that's because it was only an issue in Babylon. Right. It was only in Babylon where they had to work out their relationship with, quotes, foreign law, quotes, not in, not in Jerusalem. Um, and so I, I find this topic as a, as a lawyer quite interesting. So we're working our way through that. But I do think that was the first time the Rashba has been learned or perhaps even mentioned uh, in the House of Lords. So there's a first time for everything, even there. Oh, wow. Well, Mazel Tov, Yashikoach, may the House of Lords uh, overflow with words of Torah with the Rashba and the Rambam and the Rif and the Rash. And you know, may you be a leader for all of our country, for our people, for the for British society, but like you say, for global Britain uh, to uh, continue uh, to have this country lead the way in uh, showing uh, the, the, the way for everybody in this world as to how to be a moral and just society. Mazel tov. Thank you very much for having me on the, on the program. Thank you. Well, that was interesting. Well, should we see the footage of when he was sworn in? Yeah, let's see the footage. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of our other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to all lords, spiritual and temporal, and all other our subjects whatsoever to whom these presents shall come, greeting, advance, create and prefer, our trusty and well-beloved David Wolfson, one of our council learned in the law, to the state, degree, style, dignity, title, and honour of Baron Wolfson of Tredegar, of Tredegar in our county of Gwent, under the Queen's sign manual. I, David, Lord Wolfson of Tredegar, do swear by Almighty God that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. Mate, what a kiddush Hashem. Yeah, I like that. The yarmulke on when he swears to God. I like that. Kiddush Hashem. Did you notice what he swore on? No, I couldn't see. What was it? It was a Tanakh, it was a Tanakh of his, his, right, from his grandfather to Tredegar of uh, South Wales. Right. Yeah, and that's why he took, that's I guess, amazing. the that's amazing. Right. amazing. What a kish Hashem. Well, mazel tov to you, Yasha Koach. So we'll go over now to meet family Stern, but let me just tell you, two weeks ago tonight, uh, about this time, 
um, it was a couple of hours before we knew the Prime Minister was making his announcement at 8 p.m. on Monday. Uh, and they were due to have their bar mitzvah call up on Thursday morning and on that Shabbos. Uh, but we didn't know at Thursday, quarter to eight already in the evening, is the bar mitzvah on? Is it not? We didn't know. Uh, we watched with glued eyes the Boris Johnson's announcement. He didn't mention places of worship, um, but the government guidelines clearly said they can remain open, but we didn't know yet if United Synagogue were going to close us down. So we were on the phone. This was at 8.16 p.m. And we said, you know what, Just come to the shul now. We'll do it. They were there an hour later. Um, we had, they had a cameraman, a photographer, myself, Avrami, father, mother, bar mitzvah boy and his sister. And we did the whole service then. It was really, really nice, really special. So let's go over to meet them and uh, see how they found it. And then we'll see some footage afterwards. Following the interview, we'll see the footage of the event. Well, family Stern, welcome to Norris Lee TV. You are now live to the nation. When I say the nation, of course, I mean uh, Hampstead Garden <laughs> Suburb Synagogue, because what else matters? Hello. Hi. <laughs> hi, hi, Phoebe over there. And Ali and Elliot, and of course our bar mitzvah boy, Hi. Raf. Hi. Raf. Raf, are you feeling a bit relieved now? Yeah, a bit relieved. Good. Because I have to tell you, you did a marvellous job in shul last Shabbat, and on Thursday morning, and on Monday night for the recording. And I'm sure you were a bit nervous beforehand. Thank you. Uh, but it, it was just so good. And what about uh, mum and dad, Ali and Elliot? Are you glad it's over? Are you happy how it went? Oh, so happy. It was, it was wonderful. We didn't, re you know, we weren't sure what we were going to get from a shawl perspective because of lockdown and regulations, but we, um, it was amazing. We got to shawl, we recorded Monday night in shawl with you and Avrami and it, it was really special. And with just, very little notice, of course, on Monday. Yeah. Yeah, I'll never forget. So thank you for that, Rabbi, for turning it around in an hour for us. It was amazing because at that night we still weren't sure if the shul would remain open, and you you just scrambled together. Um, you you all put yourself <laughs> together very nicely. You turned up at shul and did it, and you were just ready for it, Rap. It was amazing. You just yeah. you know we got the Torah out and you went for it. It was phenomenal, and you all spoke very nicely as well. <laughs> I'm very impressed you had your speeches already so early. I'm never like that. Um, but that was very good. And Phoebe, when to your bat mitzvah? Well, that was, that was, not a lot of... sorry? When is it? Uh, oh, it's next year. Now, oh, so you've finished February. one simcha, finish one simcha and you're straight on to the next one planning. Yes. Um, well, there's no point planning. Now that. we can start thinking about Phoebe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you, you managed to do a bar mitzvah with an hour's notice. So uh, I think, you know, if you've got a year to plan for Phoebe's bat mitzvah, you should be OK. Um, but it's probably too early to plan now. No one knows what they're doing yet, do they? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so how did you feel on the... We turned it all around in a week. It was amazing. I, I should imagine that Monday, when we knew there was an announcement coming out, were you on spill keys? We were worried, I think, yes, because we were worried that the shul would be closed and that, that Boris would close all, all the shuls and all places of worship. So we decided to uh, get everyone together to rush to the shul on that Monday night to uh, crack on, which we did, thankfully. That was very good. It was very good. And are you working from home, Elliot? So, Elliot, are you, are you yes, working? Yes, uh, yeah. but I'm going to the office more often now. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Where do you work? In the city? Oh, it's breaking up again. Uh, no, I work uh, in Wood Green. My office is based in Wood Green. My practice is there. So. Oh, nice. Uh, and when you're all at home, because I'm guessing all your... Are you... Sorry, cut that bit out. Um, and uh, uh, Raf and Phoebe, are you at homeschooling at the moment? Hello? Can you hear me? 
We can hear you. We can Sorry. hear you. We can cut uh, out. We can't. We, can't, we can we're, cut, we're back. We're back. Cut all that bit out. Um, so Phoebe and Raph, are you homeschooling at the moment? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're homeschooling. And have you all got your own room? Fun and games. Fun and games, I can imagine. <laughs> and have you got your own yeah, room? Yeah, I'm in And you can do right your stuff for that. Well, that mum driving you yeah. mad. Yeah, nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. Cool. I don't see him during the day, so it's quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> what you mean? They each they all go on to their own Zoom lessons at the right time without you being on top of them, Ali? I'm very impressed. Yeah, Raf is upstairs and they do lots of his school have got lots of every class, every lesson is live lessons with the teacher. So Raf just gets on with it. Phoebe also, but she's downstairs, so um, I'm a bit more <laughs> present, but it, it's okay. You know, we just we just get on with it. That's the way it is right now. So maybe we should come round here, sort us out perhaps, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about your work yourself, Ali? Do you have to work from home as well? Well, I worked in events. So uh -huh. um, as of my last job was last March. Yeah, because that would have been... That contract yeah. came to an end and I've three months. And obviously no, no events since. So oh, we that's... shall see what happens. So, and what, in your opinion, how do you think things will change once... But it's okay. Well, once lockdown is all over and we've all been vaccinated, please God, what change do you expect to see in events, in event management? Well, I think it's a, a confidence thing initially. I don't think the events that I work in, it's corporate events. So it could be, um, you know, an event for three, four hundred plus people. I don't think anything like that will be happening anytime soon because people need to feel secure and confident in the environment that they're in. Um, I think a lot more will be virtual. Um, Zoom has taught us huge amounts, you know. So I think it will, I do think it will, um, and you know, we'll just see what happens. Okay, are you involved with um, virtual event planning? Was that not your thing? Not, no, not, uh, it may all um, physical events. That's that's what I've been doing for yeah. the last 20 odd years. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens when it all starts sort of changing. We'll see where it takes me. Or I'll do something completely different. I don't know. Okay, you're chilled. You'll do, you'll do what comes sort of thing. Uh, now, what about exactly. you? Yeah, Phoebe, when you're not doing school, so when your you Zoom school day is over, what do you do afterwards to, to relax, to chill, have fun? What do you like doing? Um, I just watch TV mostly. <laughs> what, we walk and Social sometimes walks. go on a walk. What's your we favorite? sometimes have to force them, but when we're out, <laughs> yeah. we have a nice time. Exactly. What's your favorite TV program? Friends. Friends. Friends, yeah, probably friends. Oh, you're a fan of friends. <laughs> I know! Oh, that's very good. Yeah, what about you, Brad? <laughs> what about you? Uh, I usually play on my Xbox. Ah, your yeah, Xbox. Uh, and I just want to ask you, I was very worried. Uh, no, your bar mitzvah was, was virtual, except for the, you know, the shul part. Do you still get presents? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting some presents, yeah. Oh, good, because, you know, it's a big worry, you know, if, you know, <laughs> circumstances be a party he did very well there's nothing to worry about few now i do worry because you know the poor kids he'd been working a year and a half to prepare for his bar mitzvah he did a marvelous job there was no party but he deserves to be rewarded you know so i'm glad you got lots of presents excellent uh well i must say it's well, been a pleasure be a party soon. hopefully we'll have a party when it's all over yeah yeah a big one big big party That's big one, yeah, yes. exactly Oh, so maybe for your 14th birthday? Yeah. You never know. <laughs> I think there's a lot of um, making up to do of bummits yeah. for parties. Yeah, once it's allowed, you'll be busy every Sunday. 
Exactly. Right. I look We're forward trying to, to convince them to have a party together, but no, no, they're, no. they're not so keen. No, well, they want their each own individuality, don't they? You know. Exactly, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. And they don't want to share presents. <laughs> they do. Yeah. I mean, you don't want, you don't want to share oh, the Xbox, do you? You know. Yeah. Oh, look, it seems like lots of fun and games in your house, and uh, I hope it always stays. What's the matter, Raph? Sorry, delete that bit. Um, oh, but it's it. <laughs> oh. It's been a pleasure to meet you guys. It seems like a lot of fun and games in your house, and I hope uh, it keeps, stays that way. Enjoy each other's company, and uh, you'll get out when you can, please, God. And Mazel Tov again, and we're looking forward to next year to celebrating with Phoebe. Woo! Yay, hey, lovely. Yeah, hopefully. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. This, this boy here, he will go far in life. So watch this space. And it gives me tremendous pleasure at this time, on behalf of the Shulam, half of Rabbi Rabbi Friedman, Chazan of Romy and Rachala, to present to you, on the occasion of your bar mitzvah, a Siddha and a Chumish. Yismacha Elohim Kefraim Vimanasa, Yivarecha Adonai Yismarecha, Ya'er Adonai Panava Lehecha V'Yinichinecha, Yisa Adonai Panava Lehecha V'Yisem Lecha Shalom. Amen! Well, that was really special. Well, Yashikach, you know, to be so flexible, to be able to just, you know, get up. It's like that wedding that happened the Saturday night right before you're, you know, tier four, right? I know, people made weddings the two hours notice, you know. Right, right. Um, I think that's one thing yeah, that... But I'll tell you, probably in the beauty, you thought you still had a week left to prepare it, but he did it with an hour's notice and he, they all spoke beautifully and he leaned. It was such nacha, such joy to see and hear, you know. Well done. Mazel tov again, family stern. So wonderful to be back, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll 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 be back in person very soon and be able to see everybody very soon. Okay. Yeah, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Uh, before then, there's many things happening in the shul, uh, including one new event this Thursday night at 9 p.m. Cedra Snippets, um, where I'll be hosting a Zoom session for whoever wants to join. A relaxed, interactive, with inspirational thoughts on this week's Cedra thoughts, which you can share with your family at the Shabbat table. So please do join us on Thursday. Until then, good to see you. Okay.